So we are at Genesis 22, sorry, 32 verse 22. And we're continuing with Jacob's wrestle. And, um, Sister, can you read 22 to verse 24? Genesis 32, 22. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two men servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And they wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. So, um, we've been talking about Jacob being left alone in a past, in a, in a past two sessions. I just, want to, I just want to look more of what this looks like. Um, so we see, what we're seeing in verse 24 is, well first we see that it's that night, this night time, Jacob rises up and he takes his wives and his women servants and his 11 sons and he sent them away. So they're sent away now and that leaves Jacob to be alone. So he sends them away on purpose. For a specific reason. And it says, verse 24, it says, And Jacob was left alone. That means, alone, that means no one is with him. He's all alone at night. And then we see that it says there, He wrestled a man until the morning. So is with this man. He says, doing his wrestling. And it continues until the morning. The breaking of the day so is there all night with this man and i think it was the last the last po podcast i said um i was asking did jacob ask for this did he plan this did he ask to be with this man all night did he know he was going to be with a man all night um did he send his family away knowing what's going to take place at night what did Jacob go there to do? What was his intentions? He went to went to pray. You know, previously we see him praying for deliverance, and then he feels a need to, to be left alone. And then this this happens. You know, this man turns up while he's alone, and they begin to wrestle. You know, so we, did Jacob ask for this? You can ask. Why did this man turn up while Jacob was alone? Why didn't this man turn up, you know, while Jacob was with his family or with the people? You know, ask that question. Why now when he's left alone at night? You know, um, think. If he did turn up while Jacob was with his family, with his wives, his women servants and his 11 sons and this man just turns up we know that Jacob was praying for deliverance so why didn't the man why didn't the man turn up then when Jacob was praying for deliverance why didn't the wrestle wrestling begin then in front of everyone you know this whole scene of we seen when we looked into um wrestling we seen that one of the words that came up was getting dirty I think grappling came up as well. Why didn't this take place in front of his 11 sons? If it did, what would his 11 sons do? Would they join him? Would they intervene? Um, would they intervene if they've seen this experience taking place? You know, would somebody join him? Would somebody sound the alarm? Would Jacob sound the alarm? Would he cause them greater um, stress? Like when Jacob sent messages to Esau and no response came back. But the only response, the only information that came back was that he's coming with 400 men. And Jacob thought, okay, he's coming to kill me. And this caused great fright in the camp. Great terror, Ellen White says. It caused great terror. So now when this man turns up to Jacob and is wrestling, what would that cause the camp? What would happen? You know, what would go what, what would happen? How would they feel? What would they do? What how would they respond? You know, so Jacob is at alone at night. You know, is he vulnerable? 
and his man just turns up at his most vulnerable state where he's alone, where there's no protection. His 11 sons are not there. I don't know if men's servants were there, but no one's there. You know, um, so I believe sometimes God, need, sometimes God needs us to be alone, away from people. Why? I think sometimes their intervention will cause distractions in the work that God's trying to do. You know, um, He may cause us not to persevere, to overcome whatever the problem we're trying to deal with, or see the issues that we have to see. Um, distractions can prevent all those things. Or people may offer wrong solutions. People may see what we're going through. And want to come in and rescue and offer wrong solutions offer wrong advice give us bad advice and we take on this advice and it causes more it causes more issues you know um, or they may be negatively influenced by seeing our struggle they may see our struggle and think it may have a negative impact upon them so some struggles are just not to be on display to certain people this is why I said in the last podcast or one of the last podcasts is we've got to be wise in who we speak to we don't speak to speak to anybody we don't allow anybody just to come into our vulnerable moments um, so it can cause people to have the wrong thoughts or feelings towards us it may affect relationships it may affect our relationships with them they may just hinder the whole healing process. You know, we may hinder, people may hinder God's work, what God's trying to do. So sometimes God does choose certain moments when to appear. Or allow things to come up, allow things to arise. Like I said in one of the previous podcasts, is when you go into these situations, when you go into therapy, when you go into these situations where you want to be alone to deal with an issue, you don't know what's going to open up. Or what, what may open up, it may be too much for somebody else to handle or to see or to witness like a child it may be too much for your child to see it may cause panic in them or a friend or whoever it may be you just don't know so God's wise in what he does he's wise he's wise with Jacob just use a, just use a thief and a robber as an example a thief or a robber knows when to come he knows when to appear to get what he wants. You know when we may come at night. Whatever he knows when. Easy. Look at the example of a hunter. I think of a lion. He knows when to strike. He knows the right time. You know he's got he's got wisdom. He doesn't appear in front of everyone just like that. It's planned. It's programmed. So um, God has mercy. You know, by not permitting this scene to be witnessed. You know, what I'm saying is some wrestles are so deep. Certain people just cannot bear the sight of it. You know, they may just cause damage. You know, just by wrongly judging what's taking place. Um, they may judge wrong and just probably just say, you know, why are you doing this for? You know, what are you doing? You know, but they don't know what's really going on internally with this person. You know, you shouldn't be doing this. This may be the advice they'll be offering at this time. You know, come out of here. You know, go home. Don't worry about this. Be all right. Can I add it? If they see you stressed or distressed or crying, upset, they might just want to stop that because it's too painful for them. It impacts them mm -hmm. to see you in a distressed state and they say, you know, trying to get you out of it when Jacob needed to go through this distress to learn something. And people just want to stop, stop distress and conflict as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't know what they've gone through and you don't understand their, pro their way of processing issues or dealing with issues. You know, um, you may not understand that they may have to go through this certain process to receive healing. And it may be something what you want to do yourself. You may have your own way. You know, 
one size does not fit all. Um, God's remedy for one person may, may, not, may not be the remedy for you. You know, um, so what I have to do is what I have to do. You do you. But don't stop me from what I have to do. Um, so this is why sometimes it's not good to have certain things on display. So, um, with that then, verse 25. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joints, and he wrestled with him. So when this man seen that he wasn't prevailing against him, he's not prevailing, he then decides to touch the hollow of his, the hollow of his thigh, and he takes it out of joint. You know, as 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 the wrestling, so as the wrestling. You know, this man's not pervading, so he decides to take Jacob's joint, hollow with his thigh, and it hurts him. He takes it out of joint. It cripples him because he's not prevailing. Now this is God. You know, um, so this is think. What's, what's Jacob doing? What, why is he wrestling? You know, um, pre knowledge would tell us this was God, this was Jesus. Um, or if you read further on, we'll figure out that this is Jesus. So just work with some pre knowledge for a bit. But Jacob doesn't know this at this time. In verse 25. He doesn't know, he's not aware that this is the presence of God. God has come so closely to him. This is the presence of God. But he's not aware at this time. And he's wrestling. Could you say that his as he may think he's been walking with God, but could you say that he's at a distance? Because he doesn't know God's here and he doesn't know, he's not aware. You know, he thinks he knows God. But could you say that his cherished sins have up, you know, it's obscured his vision. You know, he's getting hurt because he's holding on to his sins. He's holding on to something that now he has to let go. You know, so then God comes to him and he doesn't see who he is or recognize him. And Jacob thinks he's an enemy. God knows that beforehand. God plays into what Jacob thinks by coming to him as an enemy. You know, was God cruel to do this? Could Jacob have learned about his deceptive character in another way? You know, could God just give him a vision like he did at Bethel? Could God just speak to him with an audible voice or give him a dream and tell him about his deceptive character? Um, I'm saying, just by what happened, I'm saying maybe no. You know, God has to take him to a place of his place of need or extremity to open up his eyes to his own issues. So think. If Laban or Esau had tried to tell him, you know, remember when Esau said to his dad Isaac, when he said, um, "Isn't his name rightly named Jacob because he's a, because because he supplanted me these two times?" Esau knew the character of Jacob. Isaac learned the character of Jacob. But if Isaac was to tell him who he is, how he is. Um, if Laban was to tell him, you know, try to tell him, you know, like, you're a deceiver or you don't reason from cause to effect, you know, you just allow these things to take place, you know, you sleep, you sleep with all these, you sleep, you know, you, you talk on two extra wives, you've had all these children, you know, you don't think, think cause to effect, look at the issues what you've caused. You know, you've left my 
house without saying goodbye. He took my daughters without. He took them like during like captivity. You know, like like they've been taken into captivity by the sword and so on. If Jacob was to be told his issues, um, would he have listened, or would he have been able to see? You know. And what I just mentioned about cause and effect is not able to the reason from cause cause to effect. I don't think he would listen. I don't think he's reasoning correctly. Cause and effect is par par parables. Um, I'm saying Jacob didn't understand cause to effect. You know. So um, he doesn't see the trouble that will come. You know. He doesn't know what it will cause, what will happen. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't. But it doesn't seem like it doesn't. It does because he has eleven children. He, he didn't have. He didn't need to have eleven children. His wives were telling him to come into me this night, have children. The wives are motivated by jealousy to have children. Um, when you go back into the story, Jacob plays into it. He doesn't reason. Okay, if... Anyway, so... He, would, he probably would have been defensive of his decisions. He, he probably would have justified them. You know, you could say he's full up of self-confidence. So he would not have been able to listen to those... You know, nearest to him. You may think, you know what, you're against me. And that's what we often do as people. You know, um justify our position when people tell us things about ourselves especially the, the ones that are closest to us you know sometimes it can be hard we don't listen you know we don't listen to the insights of those closest to us or take advice about our characters from other people and it's so hard you know so if we don't listen to humans are we going to li listen to God can I say, I think one of the reasons why we don't do that or we find it hard is because those closest to us, we often see all their faults. And when we see the faults of others, we think they're worse than ours. So we compare ourselves among ourselves and think that we're wise. And this justifies our position and blinds us to our own faults and failings. So, you know, in the case of Jacob, he's looking at Laban and going, how wicked he is and how deceptive and how nasty a father. And he sees all that and thinks, well, I'm much nicer than that. I'm serving the true God. And so they can't take advice from Laban because who are you to tell me when you're such a bad person? And I think that's often what happens with us. Mm -hmm. The more you know people, the more you see their faults and understand what they are. And it's easier perhaps from the outside to see someone else's faults, especially than your own. And so then you can't take advice from someone you think is faulty like you or worse than you. And you say, well, I'm not listening to you. You don't know anything. Yeah. So with that thinking, we don't reflect. And that's the challenge. On what's been said to us. We don't sit back and reflect. Okay, they said this about me. They said I'm a deceiver. They said, they said I keep... You know, I don't listen. Why don't I listen then? Is it true? Let me reflect. Let me look back into history. Maybe as other people told me this and I didn't realise. So maybe... Ask, ask yourself. Is it true? Why don't I, why don't I listen then? What is it? What is it behind that? Why do I behave this way or whatever? You know, um, do we take that time to reflect and ask questions and maybe get to the roots of these issues? A lot of times, no. So, if God was to tell us in a dream, if God was to tell Jacob in a dream that you got all these issues going on, would Jacob listen? Maybe no. Maybe it wouldn't be effective. So this is why God would tell Jacob in an experience, in a um, in a ex, in a experience, in a circumstance, in a certain circumstance, in a trial, that will speak to him. It will speak loud and clear. And yeah, this trial, what he's going through now, this experience, what he's going through now, it's gonna speak to him. You know, so um, let's continue. So, what's what's taking place? 
is wrestling with a man. And then what it says, a man hold, a man takes hold of his shoulders. And I'm at midnight. Jacob sees, Jacob sees it as an enemy. You know, um, so this man grabs onto Jacob. So we know all throughout Jacob's life he's been holding onto stuff, grabbing onto stuff. It began in a womb. And it began, then, it's, then, it, then it went on to the birthright. Many years he was holding on to that, planning out, planning on how to get it. But while he was doing, while he was doing all this, doing things in his own strength, it's hurting people um, emotionally. It's causing separations. It's, it's separated from his family. It's causing emotional pain. It's upsetting people. So now something grabs onto Jacob now and, it, and it cripples him. And now this man does not appear as God. You know, um, you can say Jacob is deceived and hurt. You know, you can say like he's received back what he's done to others. But enable it enables his eyes to be opened. Now his eyes are opened. And this has to take place. You know, because he's holding on to something. Some sin, some cherished sin. Well, he hasn't let go of all these years and now he's hurt but now in this pain he learns about himself um, so verse 26 and he said let me go for the day breaketh and he said I will not Jacob says I will not let you go except that thou bless me so he's holding on now even in pain, he learns who this person is and he's holding on. Physical pain does not distract him. In the moment of pain and brokenness, Jacob's saying, I'm not letting you go unless you bless me. So we know Jacob, he has got some good traits. You know, this, you know, holding on to things and not letting go until he gets what he wants. But it's, in this story, it's, it's used for good. Um, because this is a moment of victory for, for Jacob. So um, he's holding on even though he's in pain. But he gets his reward. He gets his reward. You know, weeping, making joy for the night. But in the morning there's joy. The day breaketh. Jacob receives a new name. Verse 27. So the man says, and he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. Jacob said in the truth. Last time he was asked his name, he was by his father Isaac, and he's putting, he's deceiving, he's telling a lie. Was that a test? So. What I would say is, is ask his name. What does his name mean? Deceiver, usurper. So now we're gonna um, zoom into this now. Jacob means deceiver. This is me. This is who I am. I'm coming as I am. Yeah, so I'm just gonna put a little slant on this now. I'm coming as I am. This is me, my name's Jacob, heel grabber, supplanter. Yeah. The one who tells lies to get what he wants, who deceives to get what he wants. The one who does things in his own strength. You know, um just take this picture now, yeah, with Jacob. In order to get help, we need to come as we are, who we are. And when we come as we are, we see what God does. We learn that God loves us. Not just the parts that we polish and hide and present to others. But we realize that God is a God of Jacob. God is a God. Even though we're in our Jacob experience. He accepts us. And then he works in us. 
So the first step to healing um, is by having self-awareness or acknowledging that there is an issue within. If you don't acknowledge there's an issue, you can't really get the issue dealt with. You know, people may be point, pointing out the issue, but you, not, you, may not, you may not be listening, like I said earlier. You probably won't even listen. But circumstances will bring out certain issues. It will make, make you aware. You know, so the first step is self-awareness. You know, reflect. Okay, be, you know, I'm aware. When this person says these things to me, I start to panic. Or when I'm in this situation, this happens inside. If you can acknowledge that, if you can acknowledge a change in how you feel, or acknowledge a change in your behaviour in certain circumstances, that is self-awareness. So then, when you know that, then you can go forward and take action. If you don't, the issue remains. God cannot bring out Israel if Jacob is not seen for who he is and accepts that he needs to change. That process is just not taking place. So, when you are self-aware, what you're going to do? You know, what, what actions, what steps do you take? You know, ask yourself, what do I do? And some people just pray and pray and there's no form of action to just hope for a change. They may ask, God, give me patience. Give me patience. If you're impatient, something happens, a child is disruptive and you lose your patience and you ask, Lord, give me patience. Or, I don't know, something happens and you just lose your patience. Um, sometimes we ask the wrong questions. We ask for the wrong things. But are the better questions? Are the better questions to ask? You know, um, Jacob learns who he is at this wrestle. You know, he learns who he is, who he is. You know, a deceiver. But what's the cause? Ask that question. What is the cause? Um, what do you do to find out why Jacob behaves the way he behaves? You know, you got to go to the root causes. And what does parable teach? parables teach us? Cause and effect. The effect does not co the effect does not occur without a cause. Is that true? Hmm? Is it, I think the Bible says the curse causeless does not come. Yeah. So, so there's a cause to why the curse comes. So the effect is a behavior, is a fruit, but what makes a fruit grow in a tree? There's a cause. Why does that, why does certain events take place? There's a root. Cause. The root, yeah, the root. You know, there's, what's that verse again, Emma? What you just said? Mm. Oh, the cause curseless does not. Sorry, the curse causeless does not come. Yeah. Really yeah, find it. So, think about cause and effect. Nice parable teaching. That's a principle you, we use in Bible studies. But when you understand it, when you know how to use it, you'll be able to apply it in many ways. Not just in the Bible, but in your own life. The cause is an action or event that takes, that makes something else like an event or action happen. It's important to understand this relationship of cause and effect. You know, um, can a cause, a cause can cause many effects to take place. Not just one effect, but many effects. So we're going to see an example of this. It's Proverbs 26, verse 2. You're going to read it. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. 
Shall I cast cause? Let's come. No. So, let me give you an example to make it more clear. A child is asking for her mother's attention. She may be playing, she may be dancing, she may be doing some good chore, or she may be doing her schoolwork, or whatever it may be. But she wants her mom's attention to acknowledge the good that she's doing. Maybe to receive a reward or to receive a positive affirmation. She wants that attention. So while she's doing this, the mom continues looking at her phone. Or she doesn't allow herself to be distracted. She continues doing what she's doing without acknowledging. She doesn't give acknowledgement. Maybe she's just on her phone still on, I don't know, Twitter or WhatsApp or whatever. And you know, the mom remains on her phone without looking. But the, remo the mom remains doing what she's doing without looking. Just think of that response and think this response often occurs. It's a, it's, it's a repeated response. Different situations, different events, but same response. Yeah. Now think about the child. Put yourself in that child's shoes now. That that in, that that attention that you want. Are you getting it? That attention, what you're craving for. Are you getting it? No. Is that true, Emma? What information could this child be receiving? What could the what how, how in fact in their childlike minds from their child perspective how can they interpret it interpret this as rejection? Rejection, yeah. I, I'm not important, I have no value, I'm not as valuable as the other people in your life who you're talking to on the phone or um you're not listening to me. You don't care what I think. You don't care about me. You don't love me. I'm not enough. What is that? I'm not enough. I'm not enough. Yeah. Um, I can't do anything to please you. I'm a burden. I don't make you happy. All sorts of things which they don't even unconsciously process, I think. Again. Yeah, they don't process it. So the, they're seeing it from a child's point of view. Because they, well, they are a child. Not from an adult's point of view. They're not seeing it from the outside, so they're not seeing that. Parents are like God to us. Um, so it's like, it's like the parents are teaching them their value. The mom's teaching their child their value, you can say that. Yes, we know God tells us our value. Who we are, our identity. But that's not what the child's receiving right now. Because the child should be getting it from the parent. But the child's rece receiving something different. Well, she's, it's interpreting something, interpreting something different. You know, because it's got a need. She's got a need. This child, and its need is not being fed. So what? What's being fed is a negative. What she's feeding herself now is a negative self, self belief. I'm not lovable. I'm not worthy. Yeah, and it creates negative feelings, thoughts, and negative behaviors. Then these negative behaviors, thoughts, and feelings, and so on. It leads to negative results, and when it when it keeps going round and round in a circle, these negative results confirm the false belief or the negative belief that we've that we've been fed, and then this goes on all the way throughout life up until your adulthood. Yeah, the cause event has its effects, cause and effect. Yeah. You would think that a lack of attention in the childhood could cause someone to be an alcoholic in their adulthood, suffer with depression, suffer with anxiety, hooked on pornography for comfort. The list, the list goes on. Who would have thought that would be the root cause of the, some of these issues? I mean, there's many root causes. This is an example. 
when you understand cause and effect, you get to understand why these events take place. The root cause why these events take place. What what took place for this event to happen? Why is this event happening? You know. So cause and effect does not have even scales. It's not on even scales. You can't balance them. Because the, co the effect, it just outweighs the cause mightily. You know, um... So that means as a parent, say for the example you gave, that they have to go extra mile to show the child that they value them, appreciate them, love them. You know, because one damaging word, one, one damaging action can undo weeks of work. Or, you mm -hmm. know, because human beings have a tendency to focus on the negative, and the mm -hmm. negative has more impact. So you can do mm -hmm. ten good things and one bad, and the bad thing just outweighs the rest. And yeah. that bad thing can have a massive yeah. and um, te someone. children can interpret th interpret things in the wrong way so I'm not lovable I'm not worthy that's a lie but this situation you read it as this is truth so you take it as truth so then you start to act on this truth and then you'd be surprised this little thing has, an, has a massive impact on your adult life you end up with social anxiety I don't know, paranoia, all these things what take place in your adult life and you wonder how did it end up like this? This this one little thing in my childhood caused me to be this way. And they perhaps didn't even mean it that way. They didn't yeah. even say it in the wrong way. It wasn't even wrong what the person did. Yeah. It may even be not a mistake. They yeah. said something that was totally misinterpreted and they never meant it to be taken that way. Yeah, so we interpret it from a childlike perspective, childlike mind. And but then also sometimes as a child you can misinterpret the interpretation. Meaning, like, uh, you can think that they said this, but it, and take, yeah, and take it the wrong way, but it wasn't actually how it happened. No, you've processed it wrongly, yeah. In your, in your eyes, you've processed it from your viewpoint. Let me give another example. Ooh. Okay, um, let me give this like, last example, then we close. Let me ask another question. So we're going to go into parables um, in the next session. Um, so why is a person so apologetic? Every little thing they say sorry for. Sorry for this and sorry for that. Even when they don't, they don't need to be sorry. Why? You know, can it be a symptom of low self-esteem? You know, you critique yourself that you're a bad person. You make bad mistakes and you just feel bad all the time. You know. It can mean that you just... Because it's a need. It can mean I that... Mean, sorry? Yeah. I think there's a need, a real need to be loved, to be listened to, to be liked. Yeah. Um, but in the concept of what I'm saying is, it can mean that you have some unresolved childhood issues to where you always feel like you just have to say sorry. Because this comes with... Low self-esteem, but also how you critique yourself. You know, you think negatively about yourself. Um, yeah, that's why you're apologizing because yeah. you want people to think positively. Yeah, yeah. You to love you. Yeah. So you, people who are always so apologetic, they may not be aware that they are so apologetic, but they're not. May, they may not be aware of how they feel about themselves. You know, or they've got some unresolved childhood issues to why, well, the root causes of why they're so apologetic. You know, so, what I'm trying to say is the little neglects that continue, you know, in homes or these little dysfunctions, what, can, what occur, sorry, dysfunctional homes or even bad relationships can have negative impacts in adult life. And you're going to ask the question, how did Jacob end up the way he is? Um, parable teachings would tell us you go to his root, go to the roots, go to his home, go to his early years and look at the dynamics. Why did he start to deceive? So, but you can you know, carry on. Yeah, carry, carry, carry on. Uh, I would say you can really go back even to the time of conception, even what happened in the womb, you know, with Jacob. And there was like a war going on between Jacob and Esau, or uh, I think that's how it was put. 
something like that yeah so for time we'll close um so we'll continue um next time yeah so we're looking at we're focusing on cause and effect and what that looks like in in a, in um what's what can i say in personal issues we see it in jacob's life but how do we see it in in our in ourselves dear father we thank you for this um study that we've been able to have into more insight into the life of jacob we recognize that we all have damage and issues from the past help us to see our issues help us to face them to deal with them and to overcome we thank you for your, your goodness your mercy your long suffering your patience towards us that you deal with us as individuals that you love us as individuals and that you heal us and that you are able to restore us into your image please help us to have confidence that you can do that for each one of us and may we put our trust fully in you this day to guide and direct our steps for we ask in the precious name of jesus